You know you're gonna see the best of the worst with the shit flick critic. You know you're gonna see shit that's absurd with the shit flick critic. From Pandemic the Room, the Samurai Cop Troll 2, Man of Sense of my any connection to. So come along, see the worst with me, I'm the shit flick critic. G'day everyone and welcome to the Shit Flick Critic. I'm your host, Andrew Lewis. Well everyone, I'm back. That's right, after a six month break, I'm back and raring to go. I'm all settled into Vancouver now and I gotta tell you, it is an absolutely amazing place. It's got a beautiful view of the mountains, the forests are just incredible and yeah, I'm having a blast. But, I am the Shit Flick Critic and criticise Shit Flicks I shall. So let's jump into it. Looking back at my last four videos, there seems to be something in common about all the people that made them. Claudia and Rosella were from Italy, James from Vietnam, Amir from Iran, and Tommy from... Anyway. Some might say that it was their poor English and cultural differences that contributed towards the outcome of their films. So, in the interest of fairness, I present to you a 100% American-made piece of shit. And that film is Manos, The Hands of Fate. But you know, we should have asked for better directions at the last gas station. Now look, the sign pointed this way. Where did this place come from? It wasn't here a few minutes ago. There's someone at the door. I am Torgo. I take care of the place while the master is away. Mike, I'm scared. Oh, Manos, thou of primal darkness. Mike, it's horrible. Let's get out of here. Let's go. Damn car won't start. A child must die. Madam, it will be very dangerous to leave now. Manos, The Hands of Fate, or to my Spanish viewers, Hands, The Hands of Fate, is an American horror film produced in 1966 by Harold P. Warren, an insurance salesman from El Paso, Texas. It is popularly believed that Harold was a fertilizer salesman at the time the film was made, and although he did go on to sell fertilizer, it was much later in his life, and with his experience with shit, it's no wonder. So Mr. Warren, do you have any previous experience working with biological waste? Ever seen the film Manos, The Hands of Fate? Why yes, I have. I made it. You hired. One day, Harold was having coffee with Sterling Sillyfant, an accomplished screenwriter and not a silly elephant like his name suggests, when Harold said that anyone could make a horror movie and it didn't seem at all that difficult. When Sterling disagreed, Harold made a bet with him for an undisclosed amount of money that he could produce a horror film all on his own, without any technical know-how and on a shoestring budget. After the meeting, Harold went to his local theatre, where he himself was an actor, and elicited the help of Tom Naiman, who plays the master, and John Reynolds, who plays Torgo, with Harold himself playing the leading man. Through the years, the original cast and crew have either disappeared or died, with the only known surviving member of the crew up until recently being Bernie Rosenblum. Oh, there's Bernie now! G'day, Bernie, how you going? Oh, Bernie, I would watch out for... Oh. Never mind. Bernie's main role on the shoot was camera, but then went on to do lighting, costuming, makeup, second camera, assistant director and stunt work, such as the scene where the father character falls down the hill. His other major role in the film was playing one of the teenagers making out in the car, whose only real motivation in the film is trying to avoid the cops while making out for as long as possible, even into the night, never thinking that at some point they should probably have sex. The makeout couple were created when one of the models who was playing one of the master's wives broke her foot while rehearsing, and Warren, still wanting to include her in the film, created the character specifically for her. There was always a great deal of tension on set as the cast and crew became frustrated with Harold's decisions due to his lack of experience. The film even earned the nickname Mangoes, the cans of fruit by disgruntled crew members behind Harold's back. Given that Harold was on a tight budget, he rented all the equipment used in the film and as such rushed through a lot of the filming to save money. Manos was shot on a 16mm Bell & Howell camera that had to be wound before its use and thus could only shoot 30 seconds at a time, leading to the film's continuity mishaps. Harold only ever did two takes of each shot and if both shots were bungled, he said that it would easily be fixed in post-production. It wasn't. So Mike? His wife Margaret, his daughter Debbie and their dog Pepe are going on a vacation to Valley Lodge when they get lost in the Texan desert. I could have sworn we didn't make a wrong turn. They eventually stumble upon a mysterious lodge in Torgo, a half-man, half-goat creature who tends the lodge while the master is away. Despite objections from both Margaret, who says the place gives her the creeps, I don't want to spend the night here, I don't like the looks of the place. And Torgo, who says repetitively that the master would not approve, I'm not sure the master would approve. The master wouldn't approve. The master doesn't approve. The master 
uh, would not uh, approve. Mike manages to convince them both that they should stay the night. Unbeknownst to the family, the master is actually an undead leader of a pagan cult with six undead wives who all worship a god named Manos and who are all currently sleeping somewhere on the property. After Pepe is killed by a mysterious beast in the desert, the family decides to leave the strange lodge, but Mike is unable to get the car started. Meanwhile, as Margaret packs the luggage, Torgo uses the opportunity to hit on her. And say what you like about Torgo. The guy's got some moves. Margaret rejects Torgo's advances when he tells her he'll protect her and implores her not to tell Mike, which she agrees to. With the car not working and no telephone, the family has no choice but to stay the night. It is at this point that the master finally awakens from his slumber, and once up, decides to awaken his six wives as well. Arise, my wives, and hear the will of my nose. I immediately regret this decision. Once up, they all agree that Margaret should become a new wife, but an argument breaks out over the fate of Debbie. The female. She must not be destroyed. She will grow up to be a woman. <laughs> Can you believe that? Oh, she's right. After some heated words are exchanged, the argument very quickly turns into a full blown cat fight between the wives. And the rest of the movie basically revolves around the family trying to elude the master's plot and the master constantly punishing Torgo for his insubordination, such as staring him into a corner or having his wives attempt to massage him to death. It is still debated to this day what exactly Torgo is supposed to be, but the overall agreement is that he's a satyr wearing a confederate uniform. The reason why Torgo has such big knees is that Tom made him a contraption to wear under his pants to give him the appearance of satyr legs. There is no evidence to show what such a contraption would actually look like, but after months of research and piecing together bits of information, I was able to make an artist's impression of how I believe it would have appeared. And don't worry, I left out all the science stuff. The most unusual thing about Torgo is the manner in which he speaks and how he puts emphasis on the wrong syllables. He wants you for his wife. He loves beautiful women. He also repeats himself. A lot of the time, he repeats himself. There is no way out of here. It will be dark soon. There is no way out of here. He is with us always. No matter where we go, he is with us. There have been many theories as to John's erratic behaviour on set. One of the theories is that he was high on LSD throughout the filming. Another is that the contraption that Tom Reynolds made for him caused some extreme pain and he had to take a lot of painkillers to cope. Whatever the reason, John Reynolds unfortunately committed suicide shortly after the film was completed and was never able to see the finished product. Now, I know that this is supposed to be a comedy and that was a bit of a downer, so to counter it, here's some footage of someone falling down some stairs. The most abysmal part of Manos would be the audio. As they were unable to record any of the dialogue on set, it was all dubbed afterwards, and poorly at that. But Master, you have six wives. Why can't I have one for myself? Due to availability, only three actors ended up doing dubbing for the whole film, resulting in a lot of characters sounding very similar. I'll be glad to leave. I've had all of this place I want. The man, yes. The child, no. The character with the worst dubbing would have to be Debbie, which was clearly done by someone much older who thinks the best way to sound like a child is to cover your mouth with your hands. If Manos had been properly edited, it only would have lasted about 20 minutes. The film could have easily started when the family stumbled across the lodge. Instead, the audience is subdued to a full nine minutes of completely superfluous scenes that in no way advance the plot, like the conversation with the cop, the teenagers making out in the car, the cop having a conversation with the teenagers making out in the car, and travelling shots. 
Traveling shots, traveling shots. The reason the beginning is so long is that Harold was supposed to add opening credits to Manos, but had either forgotten to or ran out of time. So the two minutes where they were supposed to appear are now just shots of scenery that feel like they go on forever. Given that this is a horror, I can understand the need for Harold to add pauses for dramatic tension, but they're poorly set up and ridiculously long, like in the beginning when Torgo can't decide to let them in or not. I just don't know. There are other moments where the pauses are just awkward, like they're waiting for someone to end the scene. But the thing that gets me the most, the number one unbreakable rule of editing, don't include the fucking clapperboard. Manos premiered at the Capri Theatre in El Paso on November the 16th in 1966 as a benefit for a local cerebral palsy fund. According to Bernie, Hal rented only one limousine for the whole cast and crew and had to drop off four people at a time, then drive around the block to pick up the remaining people. When the cast and crew were finally seated, they were all extremely nervous as none of them had seen anything since the filming had wrapped. And then the movie began. We're almost there, honey. Just a little while longer and your vacation starts. I'm getting cold, mother, and hungry. Everyone's fears had come true. The film was an absolute disaster. We should be pretty close right now. The agent said it was about 12 miles from Highway 10, and that was Highway 10 back there. The pacing was abysmal, and the acting was horrendous. Giggles began to appear in the audience, which over time turned into full-blown right. laughter as the movie I went on, causing some of the cast and crew to secretly oh, leave the theater to late. save embarrassment. Manos was universally panned by the critics and only had a very brief theatrical run in local cinemas. After 1966, Manos fell into obscurity and was almost completely forgotten until 1992, when it was chosen to be one of the movies featured on Mystery Science Theatre 3000. And for those of you who haven't seen the episode, it is a must-see, and I'll add a link in the description below. Manos The Hands of Fate is a special kind of terrible, as there's no one thing that makes it hard to watch, but more a perfect storm of incompetence. Now normally at this point in my review I'd have my five categories that I base my rating on, but I kind of felt like they made the video a bit too long and I also repeated myself a lot too, so um, I'm just going to go straight to the stars. If you guys feel like that they were insightful and you learnt something, then let me know in the credits and I'll bring it back, but for the time being I'm just going to go straight to the stars. I give Manos The Hands of Fate minus two stars, and it would be absolutely unwatchable if it wasn't for Torgo and all of his awesomeness. And before I go, if there are any of you out there who's interested in health and fitness, then you should definitely go and check out Team Solutions' channel. He's got lots of great advice on techniques in the gym, and also nutrition and the right things you should be eating. I actually met Carlo down in the gym when I was doing some stomach crunches, and I was able to teach him a thing or two about having killer abs. And lastly, I'd just like to say that I'm dedicating this episode of The Shit Flick Critic to my Uncle Bob, who passed away recently. The whole family's really taught up about it. He was a beautiful man who loved a beer and loved a laugh, and um, I'm pretty upset because I'm here in Canada and I wasn't able to be over there and um, go to the memorial service, so I thought this was the least I could do. So, uh, yes, um, rest in peace, Uncle Bob. We all miss you very much. So, thank you for joining me on another episode of The Shit Flick Critic. I'm sorry that this one took so long for me to make, but I've been getting settled into Vancouver, and I've got a good job now, and I've got a place of my own, so I'm ready and raring to make as many of these as possible. And I'd just like to thank from the bottom of my heart everyone who has commented, subscribed, liked. I'm less enthused about the people that have disliked, but even so, just thank you everyone for all the support. It has just been incredible, so thanks a lot. Um, and that's really it. Um, let's see if I can do this. So, uh, this time, there's the room video, the Samurai Cop, Birdemic, and <laughs> Troll 2. So, thanks for watching. <laughs>